Well, it's very nice to see everybody here this morning, especially visitors that we have. We do hope that if you have questions about Monte Vista uh, or about the gospel itself, that you'll let us know and we'll have an opportunity to sit down and talk about the Bible with you. We would really love to have that opportunity. That is our goal as a congregation is to serve God, to worship Him as He has uh, dictated to us through His Word and to bring others into the fold, to teach them the good news of salvation. How we teach them the good news of salvation can be sometimes challenging for believers. We don't always know exactly what to say. We don't always know exactly what approach to take. And I think that even if you have been studying the Bible for a good portion of your life, you might still feel like you don't know enough or don't have the guidance enough to know how to teach somebody. And so there are tools that are available out there to help us with that. Though, I will caution you about using the tools that have been provided by publishers and other sorts of uh, entities by saying that you probably know more than you think you do. That's something that Christians need to realize. I will tell you this, that if you have been attending a Bible class since you were 18 months old, you've probably learned something along the way. Now, if you still feel like you don't have the tools that are necessary to go and actually teach somebody the gospel, the elders have purchased about 200 of these books called The Big Picture of the Bible. They're very short. It's a quick read. It's broken up into a number of chapters uh, that are easy to use, easy to read. And uh, the elders have asked Alan and I at different points to uh, spend some time in this uh, book is just bringing some of the lessons out and uh, helping you understand how to use the tool and how to use the chapters that are in it. Alan's done a couple lessons out of it. Uh, in the last few months, I've done a lesson on Romans 6, which is a whole chapter in here. And on the resurrection, we did a, a lesson on the resurrection. Both Alan and I have done lessons on the resurrection in the past three months now. But what we want to look at here is the idea of the big picture of the Bible. Because one of, the, one of the real challenges to both understanding the Bible and also teaching the Bible is just seeing that it is one volume, one story, that happens to be made up of a number of smaller subplots. We don't always see the Bible in that way. We see the Bible as something that's very disjointed. We see the Bible as something that has a whole bunch of different parts that are not necessarily uh, part of one continuous story. And that can be hard for us. It can be hard for us to read the book of Psalms and then read Leviticus and then go to the Gospel of John and read Revelation and then read Ezekiel and read Esther and go, what's the, what's the point of this whole thing? It seems like the Bible is just a whole bunch of disjointed stories until you start to see the great narratives behind those stories. Behind the story of Esther. Behind the story of Ezra. Behind the story of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. Behind the story of John the Baptist. Behind the story of the twelve apostles in the book of Acts. And yes, for sure behind the story of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, there are some great narratives that connect the Bible from cover to cover and prove, at least in my mind, the divine handiwork all over this precious book of ours. So let's talk about the fact that this is many books but one story. Understand, first of all, that the Bible does have a cohesive story that it is made up of a number of interwoven subplots that when you're reading about the Israelites in the wilderness, you're reading about a theme that you're going to see throughout the rest of the Bible. You think that the Israelites just wander for 40 years and then that's it? Well, you didn't read the book of Psalms very clearly, did you? So you think you're going to read the book of Isaiah and go, hmm, there's some interesting prophecy here. Well, you didn't read the Gospels very well either. You think if you read Ezekiel, you're not going to see a lot of revelation there also? There's some great stories that are interwoven into the greater story of the Bible as a whole. And there's tremendous unity in the Bible also, especially when you consider that the Bible consists of a number of books written by more than 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years. And to see that the themes are the same from cover to cover. 
remember that the Bible writers lived in very different cultures from one another. It's easy for us to say, and I hate this term, Bible times. <laughs> right? You've heard that term, oh, back in Bible times, what? You mean Bible times like from the beginning of creation all the way until the first century A.D.? Are those the Bible times you're talking about? You're talking about like 6,000 years of human history and there's, you know, Bible times. Because Roman culture was basically the same thing as Palestinian culture under King David, right? Bible times. No, it's amazing when you consider how different the time periods were where these Bible writers wrote and to see that under the old covenant, under the new covenant, under the covenant of the patriarchs, from Abraham to Moses to Jesus of Nazareth, what is right has always been right. What is wrong has always been wrong. God has always had the same nature and the same qualities. That God is eternal, that God is omniscient, that God is omnipresent, and that He is omnipotent. And the entire Bible attests to that unity. Consider by way of introduction to this story in the Bible some themes that we see from cover to cover. And by the way, the scripture references here, I'd like you to write these down. We don't have the time in this setting to read each and every one of these passages, but we'll allude to them briefly. Look at the problem of evil, first of all. The problem of evil. When you see in every age of mankind, from the time of the patriarchs to the time of the old law of Moses to the time of the new law of Christ, the problem of evil has always, exist, has always existed in the Bible. And the problem of evil has always had the same overall assessment. That it's something that's bad, that it's something that needs to be dealt with, and that God alone has the final solution to the problem that has been presented. I want to read just one verse here in John chapter 3. Notice in John 3 verses 19 through 20, the problem of evil as Jesus presents it here in the New Covenant. And this is the judgment. The light is come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. And that's the same way that it's always been. From the very first time that man murdered another man, Cain and Abel, they've always loved the darkness and have avoided having their deeds exposed by the light of God. The hope of redemption as well. Under the old law, they were to be redeemed from their sins. What does redemption mean? Redemption means payment for release. That's kind of the basic definition of it. Payment for release. To be released from slavery. To be released from a debt. To be released from bondage. And that theme of redemption was apparent in every age of man as well. Redemption is a big deal in the law, by the way. When you read in the book of Exodus, redemption is a very big deal. That they were redeemed from their slavery in Egypt. That they could be redeemed from the debt that was accrued by their sins because of the sacrificial system that was set up for them. And redemption then, by extension, is a big part of Christ's law as well. That we're to be redeemed from our sins by the power of Jesus Christ and His sacrifice as well. The virtue of faith. That faith has been an important component of the believer's life. From Abraham, who believed and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness, all the way to the great men and women of faith, outlined in Hebrews chapter 11. One thing I like about Hebrews 11 is that it shows people who were under the patriarchal system, who had faith, Abraham, for example. People who were under the law, who had faith, Moses, David, People who also were under the new law, who had faith. I think those who were persecuted near the end of Hebrews chapter 11, those who faced immense physical trials and tribulations, I think those are Christians. People who were under the new law, who were facing persecution by Rome. Faith was an integral part of the believer's life from the very beginning to today and beyond. The importance of covenants as well. A covenant is basically a relationship. A promise. Uh, the, the, the marriage vow is a covenant of sorts. And so God is really big into covenants. He establishes covenants both with individuals like Abraham, with nations like Israel, and also covenants with all people through His Son Jesus Christ. 
and covenants. Covenants are outlined here in the scriptures that are on the screen for you. And the price of sin. I think the price of sin is another major theme that you see in the Bible. That sin comes with a penalty. We're going to talk about that here in a few minutes in greater detail. Not only are there consistent themes in the Bible, but there's also a progressive revelation of God. That God revealed Himself to each age of man as man could understand and accept Him. In the Garden of Eden, when, human, and when humanity was innocent before sin came into the world, God was able to have face-to-face -face communication with Adam and Eve. When sin came into the world, God had to hide Himself from that sin because God cannot tolerate the presence of sin. He still communed with man in a certain way, though. He reveals Himself from age to age as mankind can accept it and understand it. Consider the covenant with the patriarchs. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 19, notice a detail there, something that might very easily be skipped over here in a reading of this chapter, but in Genesis 18 and verse 19, speaking of Abraham, for I have chosen him, Abraham, in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice in order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. That sets up a precedent then for how God communicated with mankind during the age of the patriarchs. A patriarch is basically a, a male head of a household. God spoke directly with patriarchs and communicated His will and His commands to the heads of households. The head of that household then communicated God's commands and will to the members of his household, his children, those in his household by servanthood, etc., etc. And you do see that played out, not just in the life of Abraham, but also in the life of Abraham's son, Isaac, and Isaac's son, Jacob, and Jacob's sons as well. That the patriarchs of a household were the ones who received messages from God and understood what God's will and what God's commands were. Mankind could understand that in that time period. Understand something about that time period. No internet. No cell phones. <gasps> Sucking! No postal system. Wait, what's a postal system? Yeah. Mass communication simply did not exist 4,000 years ago. That's the simple answer. Mass communication simply did not exist 4,000 years ago. God would not be able to command Abraham to do something and then expect the whole world to know, okay, that's what Abraham said. Uh, we got a letter from him. We heard it over, over the internet. I got a phone call from Abraham and Abraham said, God, let's do this. No. Local communication was necessary because of the nature of their society and their culture. Because people typically did not travel over vast distances of wilderness Communication tended to be very limited from family to family, from clan to clan, and even from kingdom to kingdom. It would be necessary in that time period for God to keep communication very local and very small scale because that was the nature of their society. So it makes sense during the time of Abraham for God to reveal Himself to Abraham in that way. But... As the lines of communication began to grow stronger, as nations and kingdoms expanded and grew larger, it was easier for messages to go across vast distances. So, God then evolved in His communication. I'm not saying God evolves or grows in that regard, but God expanded His form of communication with humanity to include a covenant with a nation. Not just a covenant with families, patriarchs, but a covenant with a nation now, and that nation was Israel. One of the descendants of Abraham, by the way. All the nation of Israel claimed that Abraham was their literal, physical forefather. And so God chose Israel to be His representatives in this world. Notice Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Turn to Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5, and notice again, this is sort of a precedent-setting verse here for how God would communicate with Israel. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now then, speaking to Israel, the nation, 
If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among the people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So he's not just talking to a family or the head of a household. He's talking to the nation saying, you will be my representatives. You will represent me in this world. You will convey my message and my will to the world around you, and I will use you as the vessel for my law. And that was appropriate in that time period under those circumstances. But at the right time, when humanity was prepared to accept the message, whether it was cultural, whether it was societal, whether it was historical, or whether it was simply the technology that was available to spread a message such as the gospel, at the right time, God chose to reveal Himself through Jesus Christ and to make a covenant. Not a covenant with a family, not a covenant with one nation, but now a covenant that is available to all people for all time. Hebrews chapter 8 really brings it out. In quoting Jeremiah 31, which was read from the pulpit earlier in our worship service, Quoting from Jeremiah 31, the writer of Hebrews 8 talks about the new covenant that would come. And it would not be like the covenant I made with your forefathers. It would be a new covenant. A law that would be written on the heart. And the integral part of that covenant, I think the most important and key feature of that covenant, is the very last verse in that context. That covenant shall be a covenant of forgiveness that I shall forgive them of their sins and remember them no more. And the very last verse of Hebrews chapter 8, the very last verse of Hebrews chapter 8, something is being replaced. Something is old and it is passing away. That old law was passing away. That old law was being replaced with something better. And thank the Lord Almighty that we get to live under the new covenant. That's another conversation for another day. Let's move on in our lesson here. Each covenant was a necessary stepping stone to a fuller and deeper understanding of God and His nature. And you can see how it expanded from a covenant with Abraham to a covenant with Abraham's descendants to a covenant with all people who would choose to become the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Because Abraham lived by faith and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So we too shall all live by faith and it shall be reckoned unto us as the same kind of righteousness by which Abraham lived. Galatians chapter 3 makes a very strong point when it brings out that the law or the old covenant was a stepping stone, a tutor, a necessary step, if you will, to lead us to the fuller and deeper and richer covenant with Christ. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 24, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under that tutor. The law was a tutor. The law of Moses, that old covenant, it led humanity somewhere. It brought humanity to a point where Christ could come and bring His covenant. The law was necessary. The law was important. But the law was not the end game for God. Verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is now neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to the promise. What a beautiful passage, isn't that? What a beautiful passage that basically encompasses everything we've talked about up to this point in the lesson. Now, with the second half of the lesson, what I would like to do with you is present a problem and a solution. Because that is the key message of the Gospel. That humanity has a problem and God has the fix. You see what we're doing here? We're trying to present the Gospel in a way that you can present it to anybody. To see the big picture of the Bible from Genesis 
to revelation and everything in between. And to see that God is not haphazard about this. That nothing God did in the process of revelation in the Bible was an accident or an afterthought or a plan B. Humanity has had a problem almost from the very beginning. And God has had a solution in place from the very first sin that we committed. In Genesis chapter 3, life seems good in the garden, doesn't it? Adam and Eve living an idyllic existence in the Garden of Eden. They have everything that they want. They're free to, to eat whatever they want. The only thing is they have one command. One command. Imagine what it would be like if you had just one rule to follow. You may eat of anything in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. One command. Could they keep it? No. And I'm not judging Adam and Eve, by the way, because I'm not saying I would have done any better. To be given one command and to violate it because of a lie that Satan told in the form of a serpent. That was the very first sin. Breaking God's law. Circumventing God's wisdom to try and accrue your own. So God cursed Adam and Eve. From that day forward, childbirth would be painful. Women would hate snakes. <laughs> Adam would have a life that was made significantly more difficult. Death came into the world as well. What was our problem? Our problem was sin. Our problem was sin. In the same way, then, we have all committed sin. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, speaking of Adam, and death through sin, so death has spread to all men. Why? Because we're born in Adam's sin, because Adam passed on his sin, because of hereditary depravity. No. Why has death now spread to all people? Because all have sinned. Because you sinned. Because I sinned. And as much as it pains me to say it, my sweet, innocent little children, they too will one day sin when they know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. We have all fallen into the same mistake as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And we're all paying the same price for it now. What is the penalty for sin? Understand that the penalty for sin is death. And God laid it out, didn't He? Back in the garden, He said, you can eat from any tree, but don't eat from that one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because in the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. Death came because sin came. They died spiritually. The innocence that they had, the face-to-face -face communion with God that they shared in the garden, was gone from that day forward. They died spiritually. But in a physical sense, the process of death also became a reality. They had to live with death every day. Animals died around them. Their bodies began to decay and corrupt. They grew older and older and older. And they could see it in their faces, the gray hair on their heads, the wrinkles on their faces, the pains in their bones and their joints. They faced death. That is the penalty of sin. Great verse in Romans chapter 6. What does Romans chapter 6 verse 23 say of the connection between sin and death? The wages of sin, he says, is death. That's the price. You commit sin. Death is a part of the world. Where sin exists, death exists. The wages of sin is death. That's the penalty for it. Death is the penalty. Sin is the ultimate capital crime. It is an all-encompassing capital crime. From the smallest white lie to the greatest offense. And that is where we are. A need that we have. 
In Isaiah 59 and verse 2. I want to read this one here. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. Look what sin has done. Look what sin has done. Your iniquities, he says, have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. Our need then is reconciliation. Our need then is to bridge that gap. Our sins have separated us. They've created a chasm, a wideness between us and God. And we have this innate desire to have that gap closed. And even if you're not a Christian, even if you don't believe in a Christian type God, even if you think the Bible is ridiculous rubbish and you have no interest in organized religion, I don't care. You're still trying to bridge the gap. Why is it that even the diehard unbeliever climbs to the top of a mountain and sees the beauty and is completely overwhelmed by what he sees? Why, why is it that even people who don't want to be a Christian will, will still get into transcendental meditation or Eastern mysticism? Why is it that we waste our time talking philosophy in a world that without God is purely pragmatic and nothing more than that? Birth, life, death, kill or be killed, eat or be eaten. Why are we talking philosophy at the coffee shop stroking our beards in a world that is purely pragmatic if there is no God? Even the unbeliever is looking to bridge the gap somehow. Because even the unbeliever has a spiritual side to him or her that needs to be satisfied. A spiritual hunger. And maybe they fill that hunger by climbing mountains. And maybe they fill that hunger through artwork. And maybe they fill that hunger through music. And maybe they fill that hunger through philosophy. Maybe they fill that hunger through long walks through the woods like Thoreau. But whatever they're doing, they are still trying to bridge the gap between the human and the divine. We have an innate, inherited need to reconcile parts that are separate. Why is it that if you lay out a thousand puzzle pieces on a table, why do we just feel this urge to put them back together? Why not just ignore it? Hey, the puzzle pieces are broken. It's no big deal. No, humans have the urge to put the puzzle pieces back together. It's who we are. It's our most innate and fundamental need that we have. So there's a price to be paid to accomplish that reconciliation. And it is sacrifice. Because God cannot tolerate the presence of evil. Notice Psalm 5 and verse 4. Psalm 5 verse 4 says, For thou art not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, for no evil dwells with thee. There can be no evil in God's presence. Habakkuk 1 verse 13 says a very similar statement. You cannot even look upon sin, he says there. God cannot tolerate sin. So, we're sinful, right? We've fallen. We're dying. We're sinful. We're Adam and Eve. We're all that. We're Romans 3, verse 23. We are sinful. God is not. There's a gap between us. God wants that gap filled just as much as we do. But the problem is that God is a perfect God of justice who cannot tolerate the presence of sin. And we are so stained and drenched in sin. Sacrifice. Sacrifice is our only hope. I have a debt of sin that I cannot pay myself, that God cannot tolerate in His presence. So God has to clean us somehow. God has to purify us somehow. Go to the book of Leviticus. And I'll look at uh, two passages here. Leviticus 17, verse 11, and then go back to 16, verse 30. Leviticus 17, and notice here, this is under the old law, a, a law of animal sacrifices, sheep, goats, bulls, etc., that would actually die on an altar to cleanse us from sin, to cleanse the Israelites from their sins. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls... For it is the blood by reason of the life 
that makes atonement. Go back to chapter 16, verse 30. For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you, and you shall be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And that's how humanity can have a relationship with God, is to be cleansed from sin so that we can actually be in His presence. As long as sin is present, God cannot tolerate that sin. But when sin has been cleansed, we can have a relationship with Him. So, you're thinking, where's our altar? How come I don't hear the bleeding of sheep in the parking lot right now? Well, first of all, I'm real squeamish, you know. I'm real squeamish. I, I, I'm not like Jason, okay? <laughs> you know, Jason, he's all about the beef, man. I'm too squeamish for that, though. Where's our sacrifice? Where's our altar? Where's our Passover lamb? Jesus is our sacrifice. Jesus is our altar. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Go to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. A passage that I believe encapsulates almost everything we've talked about this morning. And this will be one of the last passages that we look at. I have one more slide after this from 1 Peter. But notice in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And we're going to read through verse 11 because I think the context can speak for itself. Therefore, he says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God... That's what we want, reconciliation, right? Peace with God, a relationship with Him, the gap bridged together with God and communion. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exalt. Exalt means to boast about something. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance brings about proven character, and proven character brings about hope. And hope, my friends, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Here's verse 6. Man, and if you read verse 6 and don't feel it, where, where's the heart? For while we were still helpless... At the right time, there's that right time, right? Patriarchs, the old law, at the right time, the new covenant came, when mankind was ready for it. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now he says in verse 7, one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were sinners, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having now been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. In verse 11, not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received. And what was the need that we had? We have now received reconciliation, according to American Standard Translation. The need is reconciliation. The solution is sacrifice. The sacrifice is Jesus. You were not redeemed, Peter says, with perishable things like silver or gold, but with precious blood of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Now, maybe you're not a Christian here this morning. You could read the book, The Big Picture, and it'd be a really good read for you. But what we've talked about this morning is an encapsulation of many of the themes in that book. It's not just a tool, my friends. The gospel, the gospel is not just about following a formula. The gospel is not just about do this, do this, do this, get all the things off the checklist, mark everything off, earn your points, and go to church the rest of your life. The big picture of the Bible is that God has good news for you, and that good news is that He has a solution to your problem. Your problem is sin. 
The penalty for your sin is that you should die for your sins. The price that it takes to save you is death. And the only one who was worthy enough to be a death that could satisfy that death, the greatest death that could ever have happened in this world, the greatest sacrifice that ever could have been made was the Son of God on a cross 2,000 years ago. That Son now lives. That Son reigns at the right hand of God. And He calls to you now through the Gospel to believe and be baptized for the remission of your sins. To become a Christian and live every day for God. To live every day a new creature. To live every day a part of His kingdom. Be a part of the solution. Not a part of the problem anymore. Whatever needs you might have, I encourage you to please come forward as we stand and sing.